Thank you. Okay, so for this session, we're going to be thinking about the, the whole title and theme of how we prepare people for difficulty. Um, and actually, it's going to be something that I pick up on a, on a future session on, on Tuesday as well. Um, with us, again, I, I say this most of the time I do training, I don't come with lots of the answers. I come with maybe having done some prepare, uh, preparatory work on our behalf as a group so that I can present either a framework or some thoughts and then we get to tease that out together in terms of actually what this looks like in practice. And we'll do that both as a large group um, and I'll encourage you in a few moments time, maybe in, uh, after I kind of give some context and introductions um, to encourage you to use the chat facility actually to share some reflections as we go through. And then we'll draw some of that out in the big group as well with, with, with some of you maybe adding some more uh, spoken input, and then we'll get a chance and break out uh, in small groups later on as well. Uh, I come from a background of youth ministry, and so whenever I was in youth ministry, I often saw how moments of challenge in teenagers' lives particularly uh, seemed to bring about a crisis of their faith. But I also saw how moments of crisis and challenge brought about a strengthening of faith in, in many or in some. So I used to hear comments like, um, there's no way God could love me because he would, if, if he did, he wouldn't let me go through the, the, this hard time. Or, hey, Rick, I used to be a Christian and then my grandmother died or someone got sick. So I, I've, I've heard plenty of that. I've also seen and observed how moments of difficulty have brought strengthening. Um, I want to tell you just one about one person called Connie, who was uh, a young mum in her early 20s in our church, who about a decade ago, her world was turned upside down the Saturday before Christmas when she arrived home from a driving lesson to discover that her husband had suddenly and unexpectedly died. Um, she saw him, she found him lying on the, on the floor in their home and she had felt like her life and her family were just getting started. So they had a beautiful little toddler. And they, she had another child in her, in her womb, not, bo not yet born. And they just brought their first proper home uh, eight months earlier. And they were managing their own startup business. Um, and what she would say is that her life was bursting with potential. <laughs> It seemed like it was life. Her life was bursting, bursting with potential, and suddenly it was torn in two and, and ripped out from under her. And uh, I can remember Connie telling us um, in a group that she felt like she'd been stabbed in the gut, and it had been, and, and she felt that life was so unfair. Um, just a few months later, let me just share my screen with you. Um, if I can, I can't multitask, so here we go. Um, just a few months later. Connie, Connie wrote, can you see that okay? Yeah, Connie wrote these words, okay. She said, even though what happened to me was the worst thing I could ever have imagined, I can stand here and say, God is good. Some days I might say it through gritted teeth as I bring up two children on my own, but over and over again, I keep coming back to Christ. Now, my question is, and what I'm intrigued about, and what I think and I hope that we'll begin to unpack in this session together is, how can we help disciples to develop a faith like that? To develop a faith of what I've used the, the phrase resilience, a faith of resilience that is prepared for times of crisis, and who, when everything else is stripped away, their faith still stands. Um, a couple of you were in the year-round group that I was working with, and I shared this, this uh, kind of story or this image of walking in a forest near our house that had lots of, well, obviously trees have lots, a forest of lots of trees in it. But in this particular forest, we came across, as we were walking as a family, we came across a whole section of trees that had been cut down. And what used to be, you know, this dense forest, with hundreds of trees was now this wide open space with nothing else in its place. So once dense forest and it was now just barren and empty. 
But what really interested me was right next to the area that had been, of trees that had been deliberately removed were several trees that seemed to have fallen down all by themselves. So some, most were deliberately removed, but there were some trees that had just crumbled at the, and fallen at, at around the same time. And I wondered, was that just a coincidence? Is it just a coincidence that people come in and remove hundreds of trees and then a few just happen to fall at exactly the, in exactly the same week? Or was it because these trees had been sheltered for years by this forest, dense forest around them that had protected them from the wind, that had given them nutrients from the soil and the root system? And was it because these trees hadn't actually really needed to develop any strength because they had always been surrounded by other strong trees? But whenever those things, those trees were stripped away, they found themselves on their own, exposed to the element, elements, and they suddenly weren't strong enough to survive alone. What I want us to think about is how we can help disciples to develop resilience and strength in order that they can continue to stand on Christ, even whenever other things are stripped away. And for me, this image of the fallen trees has actually become like a spiritual metaphor for the experiences that we've actually been living through over the past year globally. And whether young or old, whether teenagers or pensioners, some of the core elements that many people have relied on throughout their spiritual lives have actually been stripped away over the past 12 months. And that has had to have an impact. So serving for many Christians and some sort of Christian activity in the church, meeting face to face. You've actually talked about this today already. We have felt the impact and the loss of impact of not being able to meet physically in the same room for much of the year with other Christians for fellowship. Even for many of us attending church on a Sunday has certainly been disrupted and impacted and stopped um, for, for some time at least. And that has had an impact. A friend of mine is a church planter. And um, he said this to me. He said, you can't not tell people to come to church for nine months and expect that it doesn't impact their habits. Uh, and what I'm saying is that we've had our habits disrupted or impact. We've had our Christian rhythms uh, and routines shifted and changed. And of course, there's been positives in how God has been impacted. Or God has been, you know, what's, uh, how God has been at work over the last year. Um, we've seen God continue to move. The kingdom is still growing. God is still building his church. But the lives of many disciples have been disrupted as well. And I think generally this time has revealed three types of people that I'll post on the screen here. The nominal, the shallow, and the resilient. Okay, so the nominal, by that I just mean people who were part of church communities because it was like a cultural expectation or because it was like a family tradition or, or whatever. And, but they didn't really carry faith in Jesus. And many of them have just simply replaced, I don't know, the church or Christian activity in their life with something else. That's certainly what we're seeing here in Ireland. You might want to reflect on, on this in a moment differently. Um, I think what I've also seen is that this time is exposed to shallow people who have relied on programs and maybe other people and events and experiences for spiritual nourishment, but they've never really learned to feed themselves. And I think those people, many of them are still standing, you know, but they, they have found faith has been a struggle. They've experienced some sort of spiritual disconnection. They have felt a loss. And then there's the resilient, the group who might be smaller in number, by the way, but who have continued to stand firm in Christ and have found a way to stay connected to his church and serve in his kingdom and keep following Jesus no matter what, who endure challenges that come their way and have a faith for the long haul. And that's what I want to think about in this time. How can we prepare disciples to face the difficulty in their life so that they would continue to follow Jesus, have a long haul faith. And that's going to require building below the surface on a firm foundation. Maybe even as I say those words, there's a Bible story and a parable of Jesus that's coming to your mind. The parable 
in Matthew chapter 7, where Jesus says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall. Why? Because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. Um, I think to prepare disciples for difficulty, we need to be teaching that storms are to be expected. I grew up with a completely wrong assumption about this story. I heard this, you know, growing up through church as, as a child. And as I heard as a child, I built a picture in my mind of a foolish man who was in a hurry. And I pictured him building a really, you know, just throwing up a house in a, in a really silly location. And because of his choices, storms came his way and washed his house away. Okay. Then I pictured this very wise and thoughtful and expert builder who took his time in building an incredibly strong house. And he had these like reinforced materials and he built, he was just an amazing builder, you know, and he built this really strong house. And because he built in such a good location, storms never came his way. So I had in my mind a flimsy house and a strong house, and there would only be one winner. And I heard the story again and again. I sang songs about it. I knew, you know, actions for it. Um, and I thought I had the story sorted in my head. Don't build your house on sand because it will fall. Build your house on the rock that is Jesus and everything's going to be okay for you. Right? Wrong. <laughs> because what I've since come to notice in this story Aren't the houses, the builders, the sand, or those things? But the thing I notice is the storm. Because it may seem obvious to a group of leaders like this, but I think it's still worth pointing out. Both builders in the story had to endure a storm. You know, it wasn't that the foolish man built pearly and the storm was sent to him as a result. And it wasn't that the wise man built so well that he managed to avoid the storm. No matter how the house was built, the storm still came. The Bible tells us in verses 25 and 27 of Matthew 7, they, are, they start identically, the verses. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. And somewhere along the line, too many Christians have believed the lie that following Jesus means that they won't get shaken. And even teachers and Christian leaders have perpetuated that lie. Maybe either through prosperity teaching, you know, that promises the good life or limited exposure to suffering. But some Christians have mistakenly believed that there's some special protection that exists for God's children. That means that we won't encounter difficulty in our lives. But Jesus said, in this world, we will have what? Trouble. Floods come, storms rage, trials happen, disasters strike, cancer is real, death is tragic. And for followers of Jesus, trials aren't possibilities, but promises. And somehow we need to teach and disciple in a way that makes this clear. Okay. Secondly, we need to prepare disciples, not just that suffering will happen, but actually how to face it as well. And um, the rain came down. Um, the streams rose and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall. Why? Because it had its foundation on the rock. So the wise men prepared well for coming storms, not because he had a brilliant house, but because of where he built and what he built on. And in terms of people's faith, I don't actually think sometimes that the problem is necessarily suffering in and of itself. But I wonder if the real problem is a lack of preparation for suffering. I think there's a critical need to prepare people for difficulty and help followers of Jesus understand that discipleship often comes with a cost. And we've been exposed in fresh ways in our faith. If you think about those trees, you know, there has been exposure in the last year. And we'll think about how we deal with that more on Tuesday. 
but there's a story told about the advertisement that a, an explorer called, a famous explorer called Ernest Shackleton ran in a newspaper in 1914 to try to recruit a crew for his endurance expedition to the Antarctic. And rather than outline all the benefits, Shackleton went for brutal honesty. This was his, um, I don't have his ad actually. So this is what he said. He said, men wanted for hazardous journey, low wages, bitter cold, long hours of complete darkness, safe return doubtful, honor and recognition in terms of success. He was making the cost clear at the outset and he was emphasizing the dangers and difficulties and it still attracted 5,000 applicants. <laughs> but what he was doing, you know, his, his advertisement brought clarity to his mission and help prepare followers for what was to come. And as we read through the gospels, it sometimes seems like Jesus was attempting to put people off. So he tells a rich man to sell all his possessions. He encourages people to forsake their family members. And he compared following him with a brutal form of execution. You know, it's not really an advertiser's dream. Yet some of those are the things that Jesus chose to emphasize. So why then am I tempted to emphasize all the benefits of following Jesus, but downplay the cost? How can we not just downplay the challenges, but also emphasize that there is a cost as well? Um, a youth leader told me recently about her experiences of sharing the gospel with a group of teenage girls on a summer camp. And she said that some of the girls had been moved by the presentation. In fact, all the girls were moved by the presentation. And some responded to receive Jesus, but others acknowledged they weren't willing to count the cost. And as she told me that, I realized that there must have been something about her presentation of the gospel that included some sort of challenge to sacrifice something, or else there wouldn't have been people who rejected it. And perhaps at times we feel to really teach and, and prepare people for the cost of following Jesus? Um, how are we preparing disciples for suffering? Just this little quote from Jackie Pullinger I love. The gospel always brings life to the receiver and death to the giver. If the gospel brought death to Jesus Christ, why would we think that in preaching the gospel, it would be any less for us? So are we prepared? Are we preparing ourselves and those that we disciple for suffering. And lastly, just really quickly on this, and then I want to hear some of your reflections. We need to help disciples lay good foundations. And the thing about foundations are they aren't spectacular. Nobody goes to, I don't know, a famous building as a tourist. No one goes to Buckingham Palace, you know, in London or the, um, you know, uh, then I was trying to think of the, the name, Notre Dame, you know, and, and says, show me the foundations. Everyone wants to see what's above the surface. And there's a danger sometimes in our faith that we just look at what's above the surface. But we need to help people to build on the solid foundation of Jesus and the below surface kind of spiritual routines and disciplines that aren't spectacular but will actually help people to endure. The one that endured was the one who built his house upon the rock. And, and I love that how this verse starts. Everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice. So in other words, it's not enough just to hear or even know Jesus' words. We have to help people to put them into practice. The Great Commission says, and teach them to obey. In other words, there's something about practice or obedience that is critical for disciple making. So preaching is important, yes, but it must go further than good teaching, but to also include, you know, personal challenge and deep Christian community and relational example for good foundations to be laid. Paul was prepared to suffer because he saw Jesus as superior to everything else. And are we modeling to people that Jesus is better? Because if we treasure Jesus, then every aspect of suffering in our, our life is actually losing. Uh, John Piper says this, and with this I'll, I'll, I'll pause. If when you become a Christian, you write a big red loss across all things in the world except Christ, then when Christ calls you to forfeit some of those things, it is not strange or unexpected. The pain and the sorrow may be great, 
The tears may be many, as they were for Jesus in Gethsemane, but we will be prepared. We will know that the value of Christ surpasses all the things the world can offer, and that in losing them, we gain more of Christ.